So just quickly starting with my conflicts of interest, I have no financial conflicts of interest. However, I am a member of the GRADE Working Group and I am uh, one of the leaders of the GRADE Network Meta-Analysis Project Group. So I will be trying to convince you through this presentation how great everything we do is. And before we get into the actual content, and I don't know if I might ask maybe Gordon to mute yourself or if there's someone else who has to mute it themselves. Uh, thank you. Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, because I know there are quite many people and we might all not be familiar with network meta analysis. So I'll just use this first slide just to describe what the network meta analysis is. Um, and it's basically just an extension of a traditional meta analysis that includes uh, more than two treatments. So in this case, we have three treatments depicted on the left uh, for quitting smoking. So if we were just to focus as, as the interest point in the comparison at the bottom between baronicolin and bupropion, uh, we can learn about how these two compare based on direct evidence depicted in red, which will come from trials that compare directly these two interventions, but also through indirect evidence depicted in blue, which are trials that compare each of the interventions through a common comparator. And a network meta-analysis will take these two sources of evidence and use them to calculate a network estimate. So this is what I'm going to cover in the presentation. Um, and this picture is trying to show and to illustrate that perspective uh, really matters. Whether something is new or the latest guidance really depends on where we are. For some of you, everything that we're doing will be completely new. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it as general as possible, and hopefully this will be helpful for everyone attending here today. So I'm going to cover a little bit of the available grade guidance to date, uh, what we're going to be publishing soon and what we're working on, and quickly at the end, other work. So our available guidance to date, uh, I'm going to mainly cover briefly four things and the key things about these four things. Um, so for those of you uh, who are not familiar with this uh, great development for network meta-analysis, uh, which may be many of you since this is very new compared to the great methods that were published uh, much long before, this is the first paper that talked about the great approach to network meta-analysis. It was published in 2014 in the BMJ. And uh, I'm going to give you the key messages from this paper just for you to get familiar. So the key messages from this paper is that, just like we were doing for each outcome, we have to make a rating of the certainty of the evidence for each pairwise comparison. So if we have three interventions, like in the example I showed you before, we will have three comparisons and therefore three ratings of certainty of the evidence, one for each comparison. If we have a network with six interventions, our total number of possible pairwise comparisons will be 15. And for each of these 15, we will have to uh, have a rating. And another key message from this paper is that this rating of the network estimate needs to be informed by the pieces of evidence that contribute to the network estimate, uh, mainly the direct evidence, the indirect evidence, and based on these two you get to the rating of the network estimate. Now, in 2018, we published some advances to give a little bit of more pragmatic guidance. This was published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, and we tried to clarify the process and to streamline it a little bit. So this uh, figure illustrates the different steps. So it's kind of what we just saw before, but it has more details. We still have our main three steps, which are rating the direct evidence, the indirect evidence, and then the network evidence. Uh, but the key messages for this paper were mainly two. One of them is that we can actually streamline this process. Uh, and there might be situations in which we can go directly from rating the direct evidence to just rating the network estimate. And we could skip the indirect evidence assessment. Um, and there are specific situations we described in the paper which one these are. Uh, but we did this mainly because we noticed that doing the grade assessment for a whole network meta-analysis uh, can become a very daunting task. And 
The other aspect that we clarified in this paper is the assessment of imprecision. So it wasn't clear before that whenever we're rating the certainty of a network estimate, uh, when considering imprecision, we should only consider the imprecision of the network estimate itself. A network estimate should not be uh, penalized because there is imprecision in the direct or the indirect estimate. Um, another paper we published was with regards to what we call incoherence, which is the agreement between direct and indirect evidence. Uh, some of you might know about this uh, as inconsistency uh, in terms of the network meta-analysis terms. However, we chose the word incoherence because the term inconsistency was already taken by grade uh, in the assessment of traditional meta-analysis. So we described how to address incoherence, and we published this in 2019 in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. And the key messages from this paper, in addition to have this nice algorithm to, write, to, to guide the raters uh, on how to address incoherence, uh, is that the assessment of incoherence should not only be statistical. It shouldn't only be based on statistical incoherence. Uh, we should also consider the point estimates and the confidence intervals of the direct and the indirect evidence. And the other point that we try to clarify is that we are only rating down when there is serious incoherence. And we go on and describe what serious incoherence is, uh, but it's basically that in which the network estimate is importantly different from the estimate that contributes to the most to it. So you might have situations in which there is um, statistical incoherence between the direct and the indirect evidence, but if the indirect evidence really does not contribute much to the network estimate, uh, to the extent that the conclusions change, uh, then it doesn't really matter and we should not write down for incoherence. Now, this is kind of the, the latest latest that has been published, and I'm gonna spend a few slides in this, and it's about making conclusions in network meta-analysis. And these are two papers that were published just last week uh, in the BMJ, so they are freshly off, out of the oven. Uh, and we focus on one paper and how to draw conclusions using a minimally contextualized framework and, and another on how to draw conclusions using a partially contextualized framework. And the key messages of both of these papers uh, are very similar. Uh, the first key message is that uh, because network meta-analysis rarely establishes that for a single outcome, one intervention will be better than every other intervention, uh, what we should do instead of trying to rank the outcomes from the best to the worst is actually to try to classify the interventions in groups. Um, and for this classification, we need to consider the estimates of effects, the certainty or quality of the evidence, and the rankings. And these groups of interventions are going to depend on what is the approach we take. So. For the minimally contextualized approach, we classify interventions from the, those that are the most effective to the least effective. And from the partially contextualized approach, we classified interventions from those um, with the largest to the smallest or trivial effect. And I'm going to show you an example. So this is the example that we use throughout the paper in both papers. And this is a network meta-analysis published in 2019 that was covering uh, interventions for acute diarrhea um, in children. And it was a very large network with 27 interventions, uh, which results in a total of 351 pairwise comparisons. So it's quite a large challenge to make sense out of all of this information. This is sort of what inspired our need to create a guidance for making conclusions. And using a minimally contextualized approach, uh, whose process we describe with details in this paper, this is sort of what we get. Uh, this table is trying to show that we have different groups of interventions. In this case, they are uh, just labeled uh, category two, one, or zero. 
uh, and we provided a label for effectiveness. So among the most effective, inferior to the most effective or superior to the least effective uh, and among the least effective. And we are also separating uh, those for which we had high certainty versus those for which we, ha for which we have low certainty. And in the paper, we uh, describe again with details the process of how you get to this. And we can see, for example, that we have high certainty that there are two interventions, as Bularity plus Sync and Smectide plus Sync, that are among the most effective in this whole network. Now, with the partially contextualized approach, our groupings are slightly different. Here, uh, we actually focus on the magnitude of effect. So it's not largest to smallest. In this case, we're actually uh, labeling the effect from uh, large to moderate, moving to small and trivial. And of course, we can have uh, this for both benefits and harms. So uh, in this case, for the same network, we can see that we have uh, six interventions that are classified as having a large beneficial effect. Uh, we have uh, most of the interventions on the network were classified as a moderate beneficial effect. We have two that were classified as a small benefit, uh, one that was identified as having a trivial to no effect, and another one that was classified as uh, a small harmful effect. So uh, the principle of grouping interventions based on the quality of the evidence, the estimates and the rankings applies to both um, minimally and partially contextualized framework for drawing conclusions, but the resulting uh, categories and how, what they focus on are slightly different. And just very quickly, um, and the, we, we are always working and developing new stuff. So um, we have recently worked on our guidance for imprecision for network meta-analysis. Imprecision is uh, one of the most challenging domains to always uh, rate. And this guidance was just approved in our last great working group meeting in October, and it will be submitted for publication very shortly. Um, in this paper, we present an algorithm on how to address imprecision. And we start by focusing uh, on the relationship between the confidence intervals and the thresholds uh, that we just saw in Gordon's presentation. And we also touch on the optimal information size and specify actually when we need to look at that and how we look at that, because it's not as simple as when you do it for a pairwise comparison. In a network meta-analysis, each network estimate is being uh, estimated using information from both direct and indirect evidence, as well as considering uh, heterogeneity within the comparisons across the network and so on and so forth. So we provide guidance on how to assess the optimal information size if it comes to that, and we will be providing uh, sheets for making these calculations more accessible to most users. Um, we are now moving on to intransitivity and specific guidance for addressing intransitivity. Uh, we have some ideas, the work has just started. Um, and if anybody here is interested and has ideas about intransitivity or has examples or questions, we will be happy to build out our work based on that. And finally, uh, there has been other work uh, that we have also published. Um, the first one was an article in 2019. It doesn't really have to do much with a specific gray domain, uh, but it has to do with a situation we thought it was worth uh, highlighting, which is how to avoid spurious judgments of imprecisions in sparse networks. And the principle of this paper uh, was basically that uh, in sparse networks, networks with uh, not much data in terms of number of trials or numbers of participants, uh, we realized that the choice of statistical model uh, actually can lead to extremely wide and inappropriately imprecise confidence intervals. So this paper goes on to uh, explaining why and how to deal with those situations. And in this figure, um, we're just illustrating the point that this is the exact same data and the exact same network, but you can see on the right how, depending on which model you use, uh, the confidence interval and even the point estimate varies uh, importantly. 
And finally, uh, there was some work on summary of finding tables that was published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology um, for network meta-analysis. Uh, this was led by one of Holger's PhD students not long ago. And in this paper in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, um, there are very nice examples of how you can actually present the results of a network meta-analysis using a summary of finding tables. Uh, the paper goes on to describe and how they came up uh, with this design. So there was a lot of research behind it. Um, and it has examples. This is just one of the examples for one outcome for a quite large network that we can see on the top right, uh, in which each of the rows in this case will be one intervention compared against a reference treatment. In that paper, there are also examples about um, how to include different outcomes in the same table. And uh, that is it for me. I didn't want to really overwhelm you with very detailed explanations. I hope this was helpful. And I'm happy to uh, get in touch with you and answer any questions you might have. That is my email. Feel free to reach out at any point. Uh, and I'm also happy now to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you, Romina. We've just got uh, one question coming through at the moment. Um, this is from Hans. Given the amount and complex, uh, complexity of conducting an NMA, does the grade working group consider developing software to conduct an NMA and grading the certainty of evidence? Um, thank you, Hans, for that question. So. I don't think the, the great working group has considered providing software for conducting the NMA. There is uh, quite a, a few number of softwares that are already available that users are very familiar with. So I think that part, in my opinion, it's covered uh, by most of the softwares available right now. Now, with regards to the assessment of the certainty of the evidence, I completely agree that it's a very uh, daunting and complex task, and it could be um, facilitated by the use of software. That is something we were uh, looking into uh, not too long ago. Uh, our main challenge is uh, funding for doing something like this. Uh, the grade working group uh, has no funding uh, in itself to, to do any of these activities. We all volunteer our time. Uh, to do this, and I don't think we have found a programmer that can actually volunteer their time to do something like this. So we would be happy to do it, very open to do it, and if anybody knows about any either funding opportunities or of someone who uh, is a software programmer who would be willing to volunteer their time to do that, uh, we would really love that and would be happy to, to explore something like this. Thank you, Romina. Um, just one final question before we move on to Nancy. This is from Ahmed. Uh, out of curiosity, how was the MID determined in the NMA that you presented? Um, I'll try to address that, but I'm not sure I understand. But when we come to uh, assessments of imprecision, uh, which basically uh, are very similar to the assessment of imprecision and pairwise comparison, um, we we start by determining whether we're going to be using, like Gordon said, a minimally contextualized framework or a partially contextualized framework. Um, and, and within those two, we can have an MID as the threshold. Uh, how you get to that MID, uh, there is still no great guidance on, on how to do it. There is work being developed trying to explore how people do it. We know and, and can explain different ways that people do it, um, but there's no official great guidance on, on how to do the thresholds. We sort of describe how to make the assessment after you have established the thresholds, but establishing the thresholds themselves is it's an extremely uh, complex and challenging task. And the great NMA group has not focused on this because it's not just specific to um, to the NMA work, as you saw in Gordon's presentation, which applied to uh, pairwise comparison, the thresholds are there as well. And as you will see in Nancy's presentation, uh, the thresholds are also there. So it's not particular to NMA, um, and it, it's always work in progress for which there is no specific detailed guidance to, uh, to date. Thank you, 